Before we start today's episode, I want to give a quick shout out to Zencaster, which is a podcaster's best friend. Trust me when I tell you this, Zencaster is like the Shopify for podcasters. It's all you need to get up and running as a podcaster. And the best thing about Zencaster is that you get so much stuff for free. If you are planning to check out the platform, then please show your support for the Founder Thesis podcast by using this link, zen.ai slash founder thesis. That's zen.ai slash founder thesis. Hey, I'm Shivatsan, founder of Clear, formerly Clear Tech. Ek minute, ruk jo, ready ho na do. Chalo, ye kar lete hain. This could be a great intro. In every industry, there are the pioneers, the trailblazers who do so many firsts that they inspire another generation of founders behind them to dare to dream. And in the fintech SaaS space, that trailblazer is undoubtedly Clear Tax, which is now rebranded to just Clear. Clear was founded in 2011 in an era where the news of startups like Flipkart getting funding had just started trickling in, but no one seriously considered giving up stable jobs to become founders. Clear was so early in the game that there were no playbooks that would help them figure out things like pricing, go to market, growth hacking and many other essentials of scaling up. They were among the first India focused startups to get into the Y Combinator program in 2014, followed by blockbuster fundraisers of 50 million dollars in 2018 and 75 million dollars in 2021 from global payments company Stripe. In this episode of the Founder Thesis podcast, listen to the story of how Clear made history so many times with its co-founder Shrivat Sanchari who tells Akshay Dutt about the fascinating journey from a house in West Delhi to its swanky corporate offices in Bangalore today. So, I think Ajit had Ajit's dad runs a CFI. Uh, so Ajit's always seen that side of the world, right? Like he's seen how difficult taxes were, how pen and paper things were and still continue to be right like it's it's still crazy like uh, and tools that are there for filing taxes or doing compliance just forget taxes right making managing your money they're so archaic they stuck in they were made in the 80s and they're still stuck there so i think that was a big motivating factor like So Ashish Singh started with building desktop software which he distributed to CAs right on a CD back in those days because that was the sort of thinking out there like web apps still weren't so mainstream especially for uh, something like as complex as taxes and then he realized okay maybe this can be solved online right and he built the first version of clear tax on the web he a systems engineer so wasn't like completely familiar with the front end though he like wrote the first front end himself and That's when he pinged me and Ankit. We had been a little bit, so we started getting our hands dirty a little bit here and there. That was fun. Not as consulting, but just because this was something we truly uh, believed in, like just helping a fellow person in the startup community. Right. The first version of Clear Tech had launched uh, the first year and gotten, I think, a few thousands of filings and all of that. And so that's when me and Ankit, like like his thesis was that there would be a certain type of income tax filer who. if given some amount of workflow tools can do self filing and yes it wasn't a thesis research but it was like hey if i had to do this what would i do if i had to file my tax returns and i think that's finally that's been one of our thesis on building products right like really like figure out the need yourself if you know this was your job or if you had to do this yourself like how would you how would you want to do it like what would be the best experience that you could create for yourself when you made something uh, i think it really came from that place right because it was painful like it would take you days sometimes dealing with so much pen and paper and excels and you know very shitty java utilities and all of that so but come on lion if you could just upload your form 16 which is a document that every company gave you that document has all of your data what if you could automatically read that and pre fill the tax return go through it add a couple of details which the form doesn't have and then press a button and file if you said that done like you have to obviously take all of those uh, hundreds of tax laws thousands of tax tens of thousands of tax laws and encode them into software so pretty painful but if you did that i think one of the interesting things about me archit and ankit like with respect to software 
in technology, I think we're very happy to just jump uh, head first and like unravel problems. I'm not afraid of reading Harry Potter attacks is one of the probably like the most complex like logic and workflow problems, right? So I think it was just that, like what would we like to see? And I think at some finances and especially taxes, right? Like and a lot of finances transactions, but taxes are one of those things which are it's like a puzzle, right? Like you are dealing with it because taxes truly are very, very interesting. It's just lots of logic stacked on top of logic and all of that logic has history, right? Like there's someone who did something which was like looked at as not good by the government. So you put a law around it and you try to make money on it. There's a loophole that they find on that and you add a few more riders, right? Like when you read tax law, it just tells you this very interesting story of the economy, finances, and like how things evolved in the country, right? So really, really cool stuff. And it was a puzzle, right? Like, so you're reading all of this and you're like, okay, now I just have to write code, I have to write technology I mean, uh, around that and build a front end, build like ex a design experience that really simplifies that, abstracts all of this complexity away, like won't let people think about it. That was really, how can you use, we, we genuinely believe in the power of software and technology to like simplify people's financial lives. And how could you do that? Like that was really, I think the key thing. So we did that and it yeah. worked. Like, like some people discovered. So, so I understand that uh, tax law is essentially like a series of if then statements, which can be coded. Like if your income is this much, then this is so, so like, it's essentially just a whole bunch of if then statements. So you can easily code it into a tool and then you can't easily code it. Okay. <laughs> right. Let me not use the word easily, but you can yeah. code it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you can code it. But it, was there the ability to file using clear tax, like in terms of that integration with the government sure. portal? Yeah. So this is the interesting part, right? Like I think why a lot of people like heap a lot of abuses on the government for good and bad reasons. The income tax department actually was a little forward thinking at the time. They had API because they genuinely believed that look. If taxes had to be digitized in the country, it wasn't completely, it couldn't be completely left on them, right? You had to, I think, you had to support the ecosystem. You can't just say that, okay, like, like income tax department, do all of that. You had to provide APIs to private players to actually help create software returns, workflows, all of that, and enable them to find. It's not easy getting that license if you take care of a lot of things because you're dealing with people's money, right? You could really screw people over without them realizing there's an insane amount of fraud that malicious people could do. And this is a place where people are will blindly close their eyes and say, okay, I trust you, do whatever you want, right? So it's it's not easy. But I think there's this, there's this person in like the Income Tax Department, Mr. Ramesh Krishnamurti, very forward thinking. He said like, this is what the future is going to be. So they had APIs. Not like, not wasn't like, ah, okay, API, like, not, it's not like today, right? Like, that's like ah, a modern API. API. Uh, and uh, I think it's uh, done. Uh, 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 no, no, it's not about the modern API, but I think things were just not that simple in those days, even from software deployment, all of that. But um, yes, that they did exist. But that's, that's been one of the interesting things about India, right? Like, like the way, uh, when we'll come to that later, probably like GST and stuff in so forward looking upi is so forward looking right like it's not there are many things which are really interesting about finance and taxes in the country so yeah like there were these apis we connected we had to do an insane amount of validation right? because the api was very straightforward like the final return i will take it i'm not going to do validation or whatever i'll just tell you whether it's correct or wrong i can't tell you whether oh, this part is wrong this law is wrong you have to figure it out right? sometimes just imagine this, right? Like you had some X income and let's say your taxes is whatever, Y. So I could easily say, hey, you know what? Actually, the, you have to actually pay three Y and not Y. And you like, think uh, you're saying that you can pay that. So you could like completely screw things up for people, right? Like it's just very, very, very this thing. And like the taxes that you pay are sometimes 30% of your income, right? So it goes in lags. It's not something you can take very you know, casually. So yeah, it was, it was like, there's a lot of like anxiety and stuff, especially with fighting returns. Shit, have we calculated this correctly? Is this law correct? 
sometimes someone would come and say, hey, this is wrong. And then we'll be like, oh shit, is it wrong? And then we look at it and then we analyze it. We do, we run a bunch of calculations. We do it on pen and paper. Then we realize, no, we're right. <laughs> at one point. Did you guys like actually learn the tax code yourself? Like uh, We did, we did. We had to. I mean, there's no, there's no escaping that. And I think that's one of those things that if you have to build products, you can't, like, you have to get into it. Right? Like, if you're building a product, whatever it is, you really have to build intuition. You have to build a knack. You have to build a judgment for it. You can't, you can't half ass it. Yeah. You can't outsource thinking, uh, especially core thinking of the product. You really need to get that yourself. So, yeah, those were, that was how, like, income tax filing worked in those days. And when you met, had that integration already happened, were people able to just click and file? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, the first version the first version was out and then we came in, built mm-hmm. new forms. And what kind of traction uh, was it, it having? Like, like what was the subscription to it and how many people were, how many people? So everything was, customers. everything yeah. was free. Everything, okay. See, we were bootstrapped, right? We didn't have any funding or anything. We had, we had a few thousand customers in the first year. We uh, had like, we had really interesting days monetizing, right? Like, and we tried different experiments. Like we tried something like pay what you want. And this imaginary, this is pay what you want in 2012. Like after you, after you finish filing, you pay us whatever you feel like. You want to pay us 10 rupees. Wow. And that was interesting because you would always negotiate against yourself. Sometimes say, Ki, Are kaun pay karega? like eh, sab ko free mein chahiye. but you would realize that people actually valued the product actually like if you build a good product people value it it creates a difference in their life and uh, they're willing to pay a good amount of money so people used like we'd suggested hey you know what 300 rupees we'd see 15 percent of the audience pay us like full price right like hmm, absolutely no problem like i think i think like clear that had and continues to have a cult following right like People are like, shit, this problem, this, this, this subject matter, this thing is really difficult. It's irritating. It's painful. So yeah, clear times in there. Like, it's all my problem. All of those kind of things. So yeah, like traction was, traction was there. Traction was interesting. Obviously from tech companies, from Infosys, Wipro, from Inmobi, from uh, Microsoft, those kind of companies at that time. And then started like spreading into MNCs, call centers. Every company, like at this point of time, right? Like, there's probably five million people who've gone through the platform and who filed with us and across the country, like, like people from the government themselves, right? Like, there's no problem. Like, it's, it's just a sim, it's just a simpler way to file your tax returns. It doesn't matter how complex your tax returns is, it's just the simplest way to people from the armed forces because for a lot of them, they don't have any other options, right? And I think one of the, one of the harder things for us to sort of, for us to uh, articulate or tell people was, okay, Look, clear tax is not for if you don't know how to file tax returns. Clear tax is also if you don't have to file tax returns and you just don't want to like deal with all of the problems that come around with it, right? So yeah, like really, really positive traction. And we didn't have money, right? Like whatever money we used to earn from those monetization experiments would just go into keeping AWS uh, <laughs> on. And I don't know if we were in the, on AWS like that, but yeah, it would, uh, we were completely bootstrapped. So all growth had to be really, really organic. So we used to write blogs and guides and an insane amount of content. I used to like cold call HR heads of companies and say, hey, send my send an email about clear tags and free filing because we're here to help your employees, et cetera, et cetera. We do like programs, word of mouth, people like pinging on Twitter, all of that. And that really built an enormous strength for us as a company. Like even today, we don't spend money randomly on advertising. Like organic is really, really important. And like what I'm really proud of, or one of the things that we're proud of when we change as a company is if you search for anything related to taxes, you'll probably see a clear tax leak. So yeah, I think fun, like, when you don't have money, when you don't have like funding or whatever, and you're counting every rupee that you earn and you're sort of like swiping credit card, keep things going, you really like a lot of creativity comes up. So uh, like 2013, you joined Archit and became a co-founder at... Clear no, Tech, 2000, right? yeah, 2012. 12, okay. Uh, 12, okay. 2012. Okay. And like, what role did you take on and like, how were you... Yeah, it was just... Hmm. 
So it is the three of us, right? Me and kids and Ashton sitting in a room. And yeah, when you just three of us, there's no other employees. There's no point saying co-founder. And we just did what it took, right? Like, and I think what we could figure out what we are good at. Ankit and Anshit are the serious engineers, and like they do, like I was never a serious engineer. I <laughs> did like design. They did like backend, and they did a lot of like the infra stuff and all that. So everything else mostly fell to me. Like customer, and okay, everyone did like everything. Right, customer support, uh, yeah, included. But uh, I did customer support in those days. I did like BD and marketing and whatnot. I did design, obviously, like uh, created like the mascot, Colin Pinchy. I created like brochures, created the website, did, like a lot of front end uh, design. At some part of the, and the rest of the time would be about like actually reaching out to HRs in the country, like uh, getting them to send emails in their organizations, making sure that you're doing some kind of marketing paid and whatnot. Thinking about, thinking about like, yeah, like content, writing content, getting people, this kind of things. Doing like work with a lot of freelancers um, and stuff. We hadn't like raised any money, we hadn't hired any employees. We'd get interns uh, from IIT and Bits and they would like do, uh, and they would like help us write code at certain times and stuff like that. Archit spent a lot of time on engineering and like metrics and stuff. And Archit would, like, as CEO, he'd, he'd do, like, marketing, he'd do business development and some sort of discussions around fundraising and, like, product uh, work. So, and, like, the, fundamentally, all three of us were doing product at the same time. Right? It wasn't one person thinking product. Because we didn't even know about product management, truly speaking, right? Like, we, because till this point, maybe except for Archit, none of us had worked with product managers. We were always engineers. And this business, yeah, that's that's all. We do like engineering design and like launching it. And yeah, obviously just fundamentally happens. So yeah, that's how we split responsibilities. So uh, I want to hear the journey in detail of the, that Vikas Puri Koti, three of you to where you are today. So okay, in a, in a nutshell, like very, I'll just tell you the nutshell because um, this is 2012, 2013 days, right? So we went from that, Consumer tax filing scaled that up, and then we then we got, got into YC in 2014, and then we raised our first round of funding, moved to Bangalore, hired our first few employees. In 2017, like we were doing consumer, and in 2017, 2017, I mean we still do consumer, obviously. But 2017, this big thing happened in the country, GST. So GST happened, and uh, Suddenly, it opened our doors to not just consumer, but also enterprises, SMEs, and CAs and finance professions in a much bigger way. And then other things happened. Something called e-invoicing happened in 2020. So it's a big journey. So like how you want to capture it, what kind of questions you want to ask. And obviously, far more has happened, you know, since 2017 onwards. So yeah, I mean, I think you you tell me what's the best way that you think. So yes, like when it was just three of you, uh, you had like a pay what you want model. Did it stay like that? The 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 payment for tax filing? I think uh, till we raised funding and all of that, it was it was it was like that. Okay, A- and like YC was where well, the fifteen, I think. Okay. Yeah, till twenty fifteen. Till I think twenty fifteen tax season is basically when. We probably, like only a very small portion of the audience uh, got it because otherwise most of the audience did yeah. Okay. But why, like, why keep it free? I mean, it's a service you're providing. Something like email being free is understood because then you monetize through ads or whatever. But tax filing being free, why? Like, So, see, I think one of the key things really was people didn't have credit cards or digital payment instruments at that time. Right? The main reason to start ClearTax was not key. Okay, here means I can start monetizing every monetizing every person. Like we really wanted to, like that was the first step in some sense, right? Like the first step towards helping people manage or deal with their finances and stuff. We also on the side were helping people in corporate companies. That's basically where we charged uh, money. We help people get registrations, licenses, all of those kind of things. So, but at that time, people just didn't have digital payment instruments, right? So, like, and people didn't. People didn't even have personal email IDs, right? Like, so imagine this large MNC, right? Like, like, when would you do tax filing? You do tax filing in the middle of the day during work hours, right? Because that's when you're like, yeah, I, like, please tell me like what to do, how to go about things and all that. You wouldn't do it at home. 
So people would use their office IDs and, you know, those days were also people didn't have computers at home because I'm not talking about just people like us, right? I'm talking about people in, you know, smaller, from smaller towns and cities and stuff where the only quote unquote computer was in the workplace. And these people, like, and I'm talking about India at large, right? Like, so we also measured a lot of things, right? Like, why would only, like a lot of people didn't pay us, not because they are uh, trying to like um, save money and being selfish or whatever. They just didn't have the way to pay, right? And that's why we never put a paywall up front. We said, look, you know, take money from people later on. And we also knew that if you put a paywall up front, you're fundamentally preventing a lot of people from getting this value which they sorely need, right? In 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 some sense, I think we genuinely had like thoda social service, charitable, those kind of instincts very strongly also. Key. Like, hey, these problems should go away. These problems shouldn't exist. People should have a much better life. So some of those thoda socialistic tendencies, which really informed how we did things, right? And so we, we thought, we, okay, charging for software right then and there, okay, fine but like could there be other deeper monetization avenues or whatever and this is this business is completely about trust and security and all. Like, we, never, we never bothered with advertising or selling uh, data or anything like even today right we get like i think probably over 200 million unique visitors to our uh, website annually there you would not you will not find one ad on any of our properties like it's truly about like, can software change your life? If software can change your life, will you pay for that? Uh, can you pay for that? That sort of like thinking that we have. So, uh, yeah, like I think monetization, we tried like upselling paid services. Look, if you want to, if you don't want to anyway bother with this, like here, get a CA, get a tax expert, like let them file the tax return for you. So we... And then that marketplace so, kind of thing. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay, okay. You impaneled CAs with you who, and you would pass on those leads to them and take a... Uh, no, not pass on the leads because we wanted to just control the entire experience. So we would, it wasn't an open market case of sorts. We would get CAs on board. We would okay. beg gig them, worker. verify them, make sure that, yes. I mean, not even gig workers, right? Like it was more like partnerships or whatever. Wait, okay. This is before like those words, right? Gig workers and all of that. And it's really, it, it was like partnerships or whatever, because because it, it, these were CA firms. These were, you know, people would just pass their CA exam and they were on the start to creating their own firms and all of that. So those kind of things. And uh, yeah, like it was still a very, very, very small percentage because fundamentally the focus was how do you build software for both consumers? And okay, by the way, we always had software for CAs. So there's a version with the clear attached or uh, com product that you see uh, in the tax filing for consumers. There's also at the same time, by the way, this is something which most people don't know, right? Like we like CNs were our first audience and all of that, and we continuously and we continue to support them, right? Like there's income tax software, it's called tax Load. There's there's a, a TDS software, there's GST software. Like CNs, in some sense, like like just imagine, right? There are probably what less than a million CNs in the country who fundamentally handle 75 million uh, consumers or 75 million individuals and 75 million businesses, right? Like insane amount of work that goes in. So like we knew that that market, right? That audience also suffers from very shitty tools, very shitty like processes. Everything is penalty. Like even today, right? Like life is really crazy for CA firms on a certain like tax deadline days, they would just not go home. Like for us, it's very, for us, it's very like, like that CA is not going home. That CA is sitting and like probably sleeping in the office, like getting tax returns filed. It's really, really difficult lives for CAs, finance professionals. I mean, the same thing is in any finance team in any company also, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so you had the products for CAs uh, like right from the beginning, like 2013. Right. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and when did you get into YC? We got into YC in 2014. And what was the scale at that time? Like what kind of revenue or number of returns being filed? And I think I was, I think it escaped me, but somewhere between like half a million to a million kind of returns at that time. Okay. And revenue? 
nothing to speak of really mm-hmm. so what was your pitch to like, yc we did the pitch to yc was like pitch to yc is fundamentally just that right like the income tax income tax filing in the country is broken right it's paper based it's excel based it's very bad tools that exist we are automating it through software right you're taking a problem like people don't need to think about anything you upload your form 16 in 5 minutes you're done with filing it's and i think that was really the pitch to yc right and at some point we can you know solve for other problems uh, we can solve for other kind of issues but like that really wasn't a big thing it was just about simplifying like financial lives of people so so that that yc experience so so yc is also like a mentorship program in a way so so did it shape the direction of the business going forward like once you got into yc like what changed after that yeah i think yc really i think yc was brilliant at the time because this is a time when you didn't have too much of a startup network or whatever and any kind of startup stuff happened, especially for you know digital products right or saas like we were it took us a very long time to figure out we were saas right like versus this everything was just like just lumped into a uh, lump into the startup tag or whatever like anyone you talk to in the ecosystem they be like hey, hey, build a market what we are a software company yeah, <laughs> yeah everything <laughs> was e-commerce at that time yeah everything was e-commerce so just build a market they like yeah but okay no one here understands this right no one understands and fintech did not exist as a word or whatever right so and like the only place where software or whatever was being built he was fundamentally the thing the us so and yc obviously like we seen dropbox airbnb so many different like companies just in tv all of that come out at the time so we applied and we got in and i think that really transformed us from just three kids in a kothi in vikaspuri to serious sort of serious like about product building about product management and stuff like that we had google analytics and stuff in our products we just didn't know how to do it like they went through every single page hey what's the drop off on this page what's the conversion on this page what is like are you raising events are you raising these kind of goals like where does the workflow break where does the workflow continue what are your error messages saying and really really go deep into like software really go deep into measuring data analytics performance none of this existed as like just like these are known fundamentals right now but at that time none of this really existed right so i think basically really helped us in it i think we had done a bunch of things ourselves with respect to like marketing and growth and all of that i think yc really helped talk to us about product led growth referral programs and how to do word of mouth it's fundamentally a little bit of governing like uh, your adults like it's you running your own company like there's no one quote and quote helping you but you have to sort of be accountable and move as fast as you want to and you have to come out and ask for help advice etc etc while they'll give you some principles and things like but i think that the network of really solid and really interesting and really like mm, i think aggressive companies around you and very smart people around you that really need sort of changes life you uh, see how other companies have done things in similar geographies other geographies what kind of progress is that shared sort of you mm-hmm. know um helps you build a bigger vision exactly mm. not just build a bigger vision but i i think nice about building a bigger vision because vision is fundamentally yours right like uh, people can't really help you with that too much then it'll help you it'll help you really get ideas very quickly and like test out ideas very quickly and you'll have you can learn from other people's mistakes and other people's successes this one thing which pg polgraf had said right like no matter what idea you have this probably someone out there who's spent 10000 hours thinking about it now can you sort of use their leverage their experience that kind of thing so that was that was really interesting mm. and uh, yc takes uh, some equity and gives some money right correct uh, uh, yc takes 7% equity mm. and gives at that time 120k mm. usd mm. something like that and till when do they hold the equity like do they i mean you hold the equity like okay it's they I and mean, you just got to be holding the equity okay like, like till ipo they, they hold it okay? i mean it depends like it depends okay. like at some point they mm. need to say something but mm. who knows maybe at ipo maybe when 
if a company gets acquired. Okay, got it, got it. Okay. So post YC, then tell me how did things change? And uh, I guess that is when you also decided to have a more formal monetization strategy. So, so tell me about that journey. You would think, but so post YC, we came back to India. We moved base from, I think, uh, Delhi to uh, Bangalore. Fundamentally, like, I think better access to talent because you have to move from Vikaspuri. Now from Vikaspuri, you could move to Gurgaon or you could move to Bangalore. It's more or less the same. We chose Bangalore. And I think our first set of employees, etc. started coming in. We scaled up income tax filing. We built a bunch of ancillary experiences like generate your rent receipt. We helped enterprises generate their Form 16s, built TDS software and enterprises. Enterprise, okay. Hmm. And 2016 was a time when the someone from the uh, government... The early funding was that YC, like 2016? No, no, no. We, I think, raised money from Sequoia and uh, Self Partners, now Elevation Capital, uh, Self Partners of the time. So we raised money from them. And sorry, uh, I'll just finish. And, and like Peter Thiel, a bunch of other people. We raised, I think, I think at the time, what, 15 million? Hmm. Hmm. Pretty large, uh, like a Series A. It was a Series yeah. Yeah, which is a pretty large Series A for that time. Correct, it was. And like, because the next round we raised was 2018. Like, because I think this is, this is one of those businesses where you can't burn and grow. Like SaaS is not a place where you can just burn and like scale up, offer cash back uh, and scale up. You really have to build software, monetize, create revenue, build features, those kind of things. And all this time, we didn't know we were SaaS, but we never talked about that. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, and and uh, by 2016, you also had a like a pricing tiers, like. Uh, so, see, like on the consumer side, we still, I think, we actually. Uh, started giving out more for free, but the market was the angle that we had taken at the time. We were, like, so we were genuinely experimenting. We were figuring out, okay, what all could we do on the consumer business? Is marketplace one kind of monetization? Can you the same? Because we didn't have, I think, or we didn't feel, like while there were probably a few million people filing at that time, we didn't feel that was enough to, you know, monetize in a big yeah. way. Yeah. yeah. Like probably scale it up even more. Yeah. And then start monetizing. So, but like other mm -hmm. monetized software itself after some time. So you were monetizing like the TDS software, the software for CA firms, that mm -hmm. stuff was getting monetized. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so yeah, let's come back to 2016. Yeah. Yeah. So 2016, all of this was happening. And like someone from the government reaches out saying, hey, you guys are the biggest user of the government API, right? Or tax API. There is this thing called GST, which is coming next year. Why don't we go do something about it? Like, oh, interesting. Like, but, you know, like consumer company, but GST, businesses, etc. And I started thinking about it, right? Like, like the interesting part was our stated mission at the time was building, like, uh, simplifying financial lives in India. Businesses are also financial lives. Why? We, and we knew, we always knew that like GST was coming at some point. It was supposed to come in 2016, but I think it got pushed to 2017. Uh, we knew that there's probably some play that we could do there, but never thought about it beyond a certain point, right? But now this was suddenly on our doorstep. We knew that, hey, taxes is something that we understand very well. Building deep workflow software is something that we understand very well. Notice how I did say SaaS, right? But like the pain was crazy, right? Like just imagine, imagine a company like any company, right? Like Tata, Nokri, whatever. Till that point of time, they had to file two returns in a year, right? Service tax or sales tax returns and all of that. Just it. And take it, outsource it to someone, do it. Now, with GST, they have a presence Every every state in which they have a presence, and typically any large company has a presence in every single state, right? Every state which you have a presence, you have to file three returns every month. So, three into 12 uh, plus one, we are 330 states or whatever. Now, and finance departments still are on pen and paper because no one builds software for them, right? Like, 
the software is built in like 1980s or whatever. It's, yeah, yeah. Tally it's, is like the, the default, right? So it doesn't scale up and stuff like that. Things happen on Excel. Like CAs, finance professionals have a really hard time. So like, hey, this is a huge opportunity. And because you're also going to businesses and enterprises, that's a place where you can, you know, make revenue, start monetizing, all of that. So we went behind that opportunity. So we grew, I think at that time, right? Like from probably like 60 people to about 300 and something, 350 people mm. in a few months. Mm -hmm. Crazy it, scale up, right? Because GST is right GST. live like right. that. Yeah. And at least, you know, consumer taxes and stuff, we felt very strongly about it. We knew it, we understood it, etc. GST is still a little bit difficult in the sense that you it's you have to put yourself in your shoes you have to think like a finance professional you have to think about accounting you have to think about a treasury you have to think about taxes uh, supply chains distributed there's so many different things that you have to do if you have to build this out there and there's a new law in the country which is you know new it's completely new like otherwise in taxes income taxes or tds or whatever you've had a decade or two decades to think about it and people have gotten used to it, companies know what to do. Now suddenly, building a solution here becomes not just about software, but also educating the country about the law, about educating users about the law when they're using your product because they're like, boss, I'm using you because I don't know what to do. You better get everything right. And you, and this is like company finances, which is in crores or hundreds of crores or thousands of crores of rupees. Don't, if you screw this up, I'm never touching you again about like interpreting laws from the government and then making them into software. And at this point of time, right, GST, I don't know how much you remember, but like every week, 100 things were changing. Till probably 2019, right? Every week, like then the GST council meeting, boom, 25 different things will change. Yeah, yes, things moving from one slab to another and like all, all these special not interests. Just, not just labs and rates. Paid. Yeah, not just labs and rates, but also laws, right? Like the GST funds went from a certain set of firms. The number of firms is continuously changed, right? Like because I think the government is also trying to figure out because this is the most forward-looking tax or finance implementation that anyone in the world has done, okay? So, so help like, me understand yeah. why you say that. Like, like sure. as a layman, I don't fully appreciate GST. Like, what's the big deal? So, for a layman like me, help me understand why you're such a big fan. In general, right? Like, taxes are self-declaratory or whatever, right? Like, in another country, you could say that I am, this is me as a business. I want this much. This is the tax that I'm supposed to pay after minusing my expenses, which I need for running the business because the taxes the GST is also a value added tax right? like you only pay on the value that you create above what you've already purchased so now in India where where you know where the government doesn't trust its businesses businesses don't trust the government and all, in this kind of system the only way to actually have an effective tax system is where there is transparency in the entire chain right so like how GST is implemented is that on on the tenth of the month, you declare how much sales you have done and what your tax liability is because of the sales. Then on the twentieth of the month, you declare what purchases you have made. So that means you can sort of minus the tax liability from there, right? And then you pay the differential. You pay how much you are supposed to. This is obviously me grossly oversimplifying it, but it's a fundamental nature. Now, sales, the government trusts you to, uh, at some point, trust you and say, hey, okay, this is what you've done. But purchases, now the interesting thing is, your sale is someone else's purchases, right? Your purchases are someone else's sale. So there is, like, there is something called the two-way form or whatever, uh, where every purchase that you've made uh, is listed there, right? Where your GSTIN or your business is the receiving party. So now um, there is a system by which there's both checks and balances, right? Like uh, now the government's made it in a way where you can claim purchase and offset that liability only if uh, your um, vendor or your supplier has actually showed that invoice. If they want to show that invoice, you can't claim that ITC input tax credit. So you go chase 
your vendor, get them to file and then only. So now this is basically like a self-governing or this is the right sort of incentives for everyone in that chain to be honest and transparent. And uh, then like fundamentally, if everyone is honest and transparent, that everyone's get, everyone gets benefited, right? You you do more sales, you pay no taxes, but you can actually claim all of the credits that are off to you. Everything is digital. Everything is electronic, right? Whatever at an invoice by invoice level, just imagine, right? Like invoice by invoice, item by item, HSN code by HSN code, you have to calculate all of this and then do that. And just imagine like large enterprises where the number of, like think about e-commerce and all that, where the number of sales or purchase transactions, they amount in the millions per month, right? There are people who's, there are people whose Excel files when they export their sales is about like 40, 50 GB, right? It's that many. That's how big the Excel files. Now, how can you like, deal with this? You can't even open it in your computer. Like, how are you going to like, build software to do this? So, like, that's the kind of problem uh, statement in GST and uh, compliance in general, right, for businesses. What did you want to build here? This would obviously be a paid service, right? Like, there would Correct. be no free, free, free or a free software. I mean, there are free trial periods. Uh, there are free trial periods. It's, it's SaaS, right? Like you come, you have like a 15, 30 day trial period and then you can start um, using it. There are a couple of other products that we built out after that. Like, And I think this year, we also moved from clear tax to clear because I think the vision always was to simplify finances with software. And we stopped being about only taxes. Something called e-way bills came out in 2018. Uh, basically, if you're sending a truck with goods, then that you know document needs to be submitted to the government. Wait, uh, you get uh, the number. Like before we come to what was the first product you learned? Was, was it just like GST invoicing? Like use this to send your invoices, it and then GST, it will give you that. It was GST. It was GST filing. There was GST invoicing module also, but I think SMEs at the time just relied on. CAs and uh, what not to uh, go about invoicing. So GST invoicing, GST filing. Okay, so reports, like the GST, GST filing invoicing. would ask you to upload some sort of a spreadsheet and then like you could directly through it. You had to fundamentally connect to your uh, system of record, right? Like you could upload CSVs, you could upload Excels, you could directly integrate with APIs, you could send us files via an FTP, um, a whole bunch of different methods because now you're fundamentally building enterprise grade software, all of that. So we could take all of that data. We would, we would like run um, the, all of the rules. We would do the validations. We would tell you, hey, all of this is wrong. Go fix it because fundamentally your ERPs, accounting softwares, all of that are, um, they are, they are built for accounting. They're not built for compliance or GST, right? Like those rules are just too complex to figure out. Like you need to spend years doing this to actually build something uh, for that. You sometimes overpay taxes. You sometimes don't take the right credit. You don't, uh, you end up working with bad vendors sometimes and you know, you may not block payments for them, etc. There's so many different things that happen. So just like, dealing with all of this data and um, simplifying it for people, giving all of that insight and validations and all of that. I, I, I think we probably have the most powerful reconciliation software in the world at this point of time because we reconcile like like we can reconcile 20 million records like that right because the number of uh, documents and invoices and items that you have to reconcile the number of data points that you reconcile is crazy works like, by fetching data from the gst portal like off you have to fetch data from the gst portal mm -hmm. which is also not very easy right like just imagine you need like uh you need like otp a bunch of otp as many OTPs as you have stayed, and those OTPs are valid for a very short amount of time. You have, and depending on the size of the data, sometimes, and if it's a deadline or not, sometimes the servers would be choked. So you have to retry again and again. You may get like junk data, sometimes overwrite it with the right data. Um, and then you bring purchase. Purchase data typically that people enter is not because it's purchase data, right? It's mostly used for accounting. So people don't really do a good job recording everything properly. So you have to clean it, validate, and then bring that up. And now when you're dealing with like millions of records in either, it's not as simple as an Excel VLOOKUP. Think of it like uh, writing a very, very complex VLOOKUP across 20 uh, or 40 different variables with like fuzzy limits. Same thing because you may say 85,000 rupees 383, 
the other person may say, oh, 85,000 rupees, 400. Now, you match that. And someone may say, 40,000, 40,000, something, something. Right? Like, there's so many permutations and combinations here, right? So, we, we unknowingly built the most powerful, crazy amount of stuff that goes in, into, like, just powering businesses. So, in, so in, the, in the, the first product that you launched, this, like, helping businesses to calculate GST, reconcile it, and file the returns. Yes. So, that's the interesting part, right? When you come from a consumer product side, like, yes, it's one product. But then, if you talk to anyone who does enterprise products, oh yeah, there are like five different products here. <laughs> you can charge in different ways, you can just think. So, I think that was also a very interesting journey, right? Like, understanding, because you've gone from now, only being a consumer company, to now being an enterprise company as well. Now being a CA company as well, an SME company as well. So, very sort of interesting, challenging sort of Right, they're figuring out, okay, how do you do all of this? Because, you know, sales, BD, uh, like marketing, uh, collection, just the quality of software, the kind of like certifications and the kind of language that you have to say communication is so very different, right? Like, And there are very few, I think, companies out there that you can, you know, look at and say, oh, okay, these people are doing two different things. Let us learn from them. So we had to like figure all of this out ourselves. I get to build, we have consumer DNA, great. Now we have to build enterprise DNA and it's still work in progress. Mm. Yeah. How did you figure out pricing for this? Like like 2017, like... Right, we gave a lot of very complex, very valuable software for free in the beginning because we just didn't know how to charge. We like, we tried out different models. We sold like, li we sold like just annual licenses. We didn't license and meet our people. We didn't check for usage and all of that. Insane amount of abuse and whatnot we had like uh, a lot of because we were selling software to smes and CAs and enterprises there's a lot of collision right like are you same software you're selling for this much those weird kind of things yeah i mean it it wasn't easy we just had to go do the hard yards figure out like and you know sometimes you go into when a young salesperson they go to like an enterprise cfo the guy like you you'd say ha huh, here this is this is such awesome software, school software is going to create so much value in your life and sales. It's like a couple of lakhs is the ASP. And CFO will be like, I have 20, uh, the, the selling price, sorry. The, the average selling price. Like, okay, sorry, I mean, it's a very weird shit. But like, you know, you'd go to an enterprise, you'd go to the CFO and you tell the CFO, yeah, the cost of the software is like two lakhs or something. CFO sees like a young sales guy on the other side and says, yeah, yeah, I have like 20,000 rupees. <laughs> so you know, going, going all the way from there to now building like a huge enterprise brand, very, very interesting journey, like figuring out everything. Like, I mean, there's no, I can't tell you any sort of secret or any kind of like quick hack to achieve this. It was just like doing the hard yards, making an insane number of mistakes, but just stay with the problem, right? Like, it's very easy to get disheartened and say, you, you build software of value. At some point, people will genuinely see the value, right? If it solves a problem, if it like saves them time, saves them money, gives them peace of mind, you are creating more value for them than you're charging, right? Like, mm -hmm. you'll see that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, like, you were talking about the journey from clear tax to clear and how after this GST solution, what were the subsequent steps and that led to the rebrand also? So so tell me about that that journey. Like, So 2017, after GST was launched, there was something called eBay bills that uh, happened in the country. Basically, whenever you're sending out goods as a business, you now need to, the invoice needs to be sent to the government. You get an eBay bill number. And that's what goes with the, you know, shipment or the goods. And unless you have that eBay bill, it's you can't send goods out, right? Like uh, the the where well, truck is waiting at the warehouse in some sense. So we built software for that. Fast forward a couple of years in 2020, the government said that eBay bill is good for goods invoices and stuff. But now, for any business, no matter what invoice you're creating, right? Like uh, B2B or B2C send that invoice to the government and then only it becomes valid. So this is a huge thing which has happened to the country. Most people don't realize it also, right? Like this is called e-invoicing. 
and the government launched it in tears, right? They said that, okay, October 2020 is only 500 crore plus. Then January 2021, 100 crore plus, April 15 crore plus, etc., etc. So uh, they launched it in uh, stages, but basically for any... How, how does this work, like uh, e-invoicing, again, as an outsider who, who doesn't know? Yeah, like so e-invoicing and e-way bill, right, is real time. Basically, um, you see, if you're if you're if you're a B two B, creating a B two B invoice or something, as soon as you make it in your ERP, you have to. There are one forty fields that you need to fill off. That needs to be sent to the government, and it automatically responds with a IRN of sorts. And then you have to put that into your invoice. You have to print it in a particular format. There's a QR code that comes out. You have to put that in as well. So that anything can be checked for validity, you know, because GST is downstream, invoicing is upstream. So, you know, what, like now the government. What, what is the difference? Yeah. Sorry, like GST downstream, sure, invoicing the, the upstream. Like the government gets to know about every sale or purchase when it is punched in, as opposed to getting it like forty-five days later in a GST return or something like that. So I think far more uh, data coming in, right? So, basically, now, if uh, GST is monthly, uh, this is real thing, right? Like, four in the morning, the four in the morning, the, the sofa that you ordered from IKEA has to leave that warehouse and come to you. So, but without an e bill or an IR, like, uh, e-invoicing, like, uh, number, it can't leave the warehouse. So, now, fundamentally, we were at a stage where we're now powering millions of invoices. Yeah, I want to ask more about this e bill and e-invoicing. So, uh, e-invoicing is replacing e bill? Like, if you have an e-invoice, then you don't need a e bill? Or, or so, um, e like... bill is a subset in some sense. They're, they're now combined, but it's a subset, right? Like, the e bill is... So, when you order when you order something on Amazon or like, which comes from abroad or whatever, you get something called an AWB, which is an air bill number. That's, that's for the transporter. That's for logistics. So, e bills are for logistics. The e-invoice is basically the digital version of the invoice itself. itself. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, like, e bill would only be covering when there's a transportation element, but e-invoice will cover everything, whether there's a transportation element or not. Both kind of invoices then need to get registered. And before you can actually send an invoice to your customer, you need to get that IRN. So, that's why it is real-time. I mean, think of it this way, like, the invoice isn't valid if it isn't an invoice. It's like that mandatory mm-hmm. invoice. So, so um, for large companies, they can no longer like this paper me bill cut ke dena. That is no longer possible correct. now. Correct. Uh, okay. Okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. And uh, this is uh, what is the rollout plan for this? Like uh, you said, first five hundred crore. Rolled out, plus, it's rolled out to all companies above fifty crore at this point of time. Soon it'll come to companies below fifty crore um, in either one big bang or a couple of phases, I think that's still happening. So the interesting thing part about this, this is real time, right? Like this happens at any time. So now that means your software, your API, your infrastructures, it's it's sort of like payment gateways or anything, but like there's even more data that you're processing and you're sending. And you need to rely on so many different third parties, right? Like you have to integrate with ERPs, you have to integrate with the government, you have to make sure that everything is up and running. You have to have two or three fail saves if something doesn't work. Because if you screw up, you're fundamentally affecting commerce in the country, right? You're creating crores of losses for businesses. So it's that kind of criticality that now your software is dealing with. So we built software for that. Like, and this is this affects payments, this affects like credit and all of that. So I think with all of these changes, right? And with COVID, with with like deeper penetration of like the internet with digitization, with better payments infrastructure and UPI and whatnot. I think like businesses have realized that, okay, moving, changing their archaic systems into digital is not just helpful from a time savings for people perspective, but also getting paid faster. Like the nature, because like you have data which is available so digitally right now, like the nature of credit also is changing so much, right? Like Today, like credit in the country for any business, it's completely collateral based, right? Like a bank would just give you credit. How okay, you have this business, you have this inventory, great. Now, like credit can genuinely be based on merit, right? Like 
how much business are you doing? Who are you doing business with? Businesses now have with all of this, right? Like GST, invoicing, bills, etc. You have so much digital data. All of this is happening, right? Right? Like with actually extending credit to businesses. We're working with large enterprises, giving credit to their supply chains. We are um, solving for vendor payments and all of that out with their ERPs. No. We know, like, now the word clear tax, right? Like, as a brand for the public, I think, started, like, not being the right articulation of who we are. Until this point, we weren't like, oh, we're like, okay, you know, we're doing work, we're doing things, we're clear tax, I know, but we're clear tax, but we're doing more. Like, that was in this. But I think the beginning of uh, this year, we're like, okay, this is something that we need to change. We tried out a whole bunch of different names and we're like, yeah, like clear, clear is the best something. <laughs> it really sort of represents, I think, who we are. Things are clear with um, clear. I, I never get, I'll, I'll never get tired of saying that. So that's where we decided that okay, you know what? Uh, we are clear. We build SaaS for invoices, payments, taxes, and credit. That's our new articulation. Uh, Really speak. We continue to, you know, be on the mission of simplifying finances for India. That hasn't changed. But so many other things have. I think only now have people started realizing that, huh, they only they don't only do consumer taxes, huh? Okay, they do so much. <laughs> yeah. That was like the journey of like actually doing all of this, like powering like millions of invoices. Like millions of invoices every week, powering like a lot of credit, a lot of payments for businesses, creating an operating system for small businesses. One of our products called Clear One. That's like fundamentally like the OS for businesses, right? Like SMEs. Like how can you do everything that you wanted, like invoices, payments, taxes, credit, all of that through one app itself, right? Like also going mobile. Like I think over the past couple of years, we have shifted from a pure web product to a uh, mobile oriented product as well. I think we realized that, okay, now we have to do justice to like um, what we are as a company and that's where mm -hmm. it's clear. Okay. Yep. So, so what are, like you said, payments and credit are like the, the roadmap now in terms of building products. Yeah? So, so what are you building in payments? Let's first talk payments, then we can talk credit. I like payments is still, I think, skunk works right now. So I won't talk about payments, but I could talk about like, I could talk about like what we're doing on SME. I could talk about what we're doing on uh, credit, all of those things, if that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure, sure. Yeah, please sure. go ahead. Yeah. So, like, now with GST, e invoices, all of that, businesses have an insane amount of data. And like, there's now evidence of who you're working with, who you're who you're buying from, who you're selling to, like what the health of your business is, et cetera, et cetera. You obviously have to deal with an insane amount of data, crunch it, but we can we can now help supply, or we now help, actually we now help supply chains with like just getting credit faster, getting paid earlier. So we have, we have an invoicing, we have an invoice discounting product uh, where we're working with enterprises, financiers, and vendors, like, you can just open, you'll get notifications on the invoices that you have, which can be like where you can get early payments. So we are powering all of that credit via treasury, via bank financing, all of that. So that's happening in a pretty big way. On the SME side for, you know, these vendors and SMEs in general, we have this product called Clear One, which is the... Like how we internally talk about it is that it's like the operating system for businesses, right? Like you create invoices, you receive payments, you get... You receive payments in what way? Like, like you get the payment receive payments. Okay. Yes. So fundamentally, so think of it this way, right? Like when, when a business does a transaction with you, there are five or six different things happening or which will happen, right? Like there's an invoice that has to go out. There is payment that has to be collected. There is down the line an e-invoice, an e way bill that has to be created. There is taxes that have to be computed. And when we're talking about the invoice that has to be created, it's not just a simple like receipt or whatever. Right? Then it's a full-fledged 
invoice with those 140 fields or whatever that makes it a valid invoice that needs to be sent out to someone. So all of these things happen in the background, right? Now, how can you just take away all of this complexity and just make it like dead simple for businesses? So that's where our software Clear One comes in. You like enter a bunch of details on a mobile app, boom, everything happens in the background. Of you. A payment link sent out, you can collect payments directly from, you know, your customers and taxes like computed for you, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So like, like far, far beyond like old accounting systems, like this is truly like operating system for your business in itself. And and does it double up as an accounting system also? Like you can does it double up as an accounting system today? But so it is it is on the it is on the it's on the roadmap. But I think what's getting interesting is like in other places in the world, right? Like accounting systems or ERPs and invoicing systems are actually now becoming different. In India, for example, people haven't ever thought that deeply about invoicing versus accounting. Because accounting used to be something that you give to like your accountant, back office kind of thing. You don't have to care about it. Whatever they use, they use. But now all of these things are really changing, right? Like if you don't do your accounting properly on a regular basis, you have a horrible time dealing with taxes and compliances and whatnot. Invoicing is sort of like the gateway into all of this. Got it. Okay. And are you also planning to do stuff like POS software, like for like retail level companies and stuff? Not like at that. this time. Mm. Not at this time. Mm. But uh, are you like looking to do acquisitions and become like full stack? Like say acquiring a POS software company or stuff like that? I think like, I think those strategies we still are figuring out, but uh, yeah, nothing to say about it at this time. I think e-invoicing, e-invoicing, interestingly, e-invoicing helped us go international also. So just about uh, like a couple of weeks ago, 4th of December is basically when e-invoicing software went live in Saudi Arabia as well. So, and we're expanding in the Middle East with invoices and taxes soon and, you know, other geographies in the world as well. So that's also very interesting stuff that's happening. Hmm. So like Saudi has like a similar requirement from the government of making an e-invoice or you're just talking of like a, not a, like a government linked e-invoice, but just a invoicing software. E-invoicing is one of those things which is also an international phenomenon in some way. E-invoicing basically is the digitization of an invoice and standardization of an invoice in some sense, that has never existed, right? Like it improves how businesses, you know, operate with each other. You don't have to sit and waste time punching in data all the time. So like the e-invoice global phenomenon, like there is mandatory e-invoicing in Latin America. India is the first geography outside of that, which is doing mandatory B2B invoicing. There are certain, like Europe, for example, has mandatory B2G e-invoicing, like when you're invoicing to the government and everyone, People are moving into the B2B zone and stuff. So with, with I think, other geographies like Middle East and Australia and whatnot, e-invoicing is something that the government or the regulators are bringing in as well to start. Like actually seeing data on how businesses uh, operate, actually trying to figure out what's happening in the economy. and Yeah, yeah, yeah. More, more so, real-time insights. Exactly. So Saudi Arabia is like one of the countries which is like starting that right now in the Middle East. Like UAE is also going to go live with that soon and then a bunch of other places uh, as well. So like, and fundamentally e-invoicing is similar, right? Like there will be, there will be language changes, there will be layout changes, there'll be some rules here and there. But for the large part, it's similar. There are geographically specific things. So now... You're not dealing with tax law in one country, you're now dealing with tax law across the uh, world, right? So what's also like how we see, like at some point go from simplifying finances for Indians to simplifying finances for the world. That's also one direction in which we're heading into. Cool. So like currently, are you at liberty to tell me like wh what is like your ARR or like what, what what will be your revenue this year? I wouldn't I wouldn't comment on that. Right? Okay, okay, okay. But what is the split of your revenue? Like which product or business line gives how much sure. revenue? I mean, obviously the 
the enterprise the enterprise side of the business gets all of the revenue but i think through our journey right like we've we've always thought about like monetization has always been something that we knew that we had to bake into the product so right? it's not ki ha ba unhe dekhenge or figure out some ad based monetization or whatever i think like we do monetize on all of our uh, businesses like whether it's ca whether it's sme or consumer as well but enterprise businesses are obviously the places where asps goes into lakhs and crores etc so i think that's a place which would always be how is the pricing done like is it on a like a turnover basis or is it on number no, of invoices so or like pricing is basically done in terms of it's it's a it's a mix of number of like how much data you bring into the system so number of invoices items reconciliation for example is very compute intensive like depending on how much reconciliation is that you're doing because if you reconcile it if you reconcile more right like we have a product called max itc which fundamentally like can help you get about 3 4% more on your ebitda and right? because fundamentally there are a lot of business on all businesses uh, across the country right like uh, calculating how much taxes to pay which vendors you know have actually are compliant or not compliant where to block payments where to block taxes these are questions that a lot of companies don't have answers to and because of this there's a lot of lack of optimization and efficiency in the kind of payments that they right so we have max itc product and credit products which are which actually like create value for businesses and they are obviously at a different pricing you need to do a lot of the the credit product is that like a product you price uh, from like the borrower or, or the lender is sharing the interest revenue with you the credit product just launching we're just launching there have been a bunch of like there are early beta customers and all of that we've done this with um actually seeing an insane amount of value so we will quote and quote do a public launch but the thing is i like depend like if this comes out let's say in march then maybe the pr would have happened by then on the credit product uh, basically we so we work with enterprises and we do early payment for them and these early payments go as a discount on the invoice value so that's that discount is basically where enterprises earn money and that sub part of it is shared with you so we, we we do yes we do we do a sharing on that mm-hmm. got it got it okay okay and like going forward say for at 25 what do you see as the revenue split between various businesses i mean and why i'm asking is because i think credit is like the flavor of the decade you could say in a way that credit is what everyone wants to monetize on so do you see credit as becoming like your flagship contributor to revenue or will it still be saas subscription or what do you think it's going to be look like so that's a very interesting question like how we genuinely think about it is that i think these two business lines right like it's it's not either or like i think ours like 2025 i think the clears software is going to be fundamentally powering most businesses in india whether really small or really large irrespective right like so i think subscription is going to be a very it's going to be a significant revenue driver and i think financial services credit payments i think that is going to be either as big or you know larger than the subscription saas subscription side of the revenue side okay got it got it okay okay currently what is the split like in terms of like 50% of your revenue comes from say enterprise clients or what like uh, are you at liberty to give a like a rough split most of the primary revenue channel is enterprise but enterprises see like that's the interesting part right like enterprises for us go all the way from someone who uh, has a turnover of 50 crore because in invoicing and all of that has started at that they also take our tax products and other products all the way to like some of the biggest brands in the country who are using us for e invoicing like taxes credit all of that 
Mm-hmm. Got it. Got it. Yeah, at least two third of your revenue must be coming from this. I am guessing, like or mm-hmm. or more, right? Mm-hmm. Got it. Okay. So tell me about the funding journey. So you had that fifteen million fundraise so from Sequoia and a couple of others. So uh, subsequent to that, w- what has been the funding journey? Sure. So we raised a Series A from uh, Sev's called Elevation. Um. So in twenty eighteen. We raised a Series B, a 50 million Series B from composite capital and existing uh, investors. And then fast forward to this year, 2021, we raised the Series C from uh, Stripe, Cora Capital. And so, uh, and how much did you raise the Series C? We raised, we raised uh, 75 million uh, Series C from Cora Capital, Stripe, uh, and a bunch of other investors. This was The Spotlight, presented by The Podium. To listen to more such interesting conversations, log on to thepodium.in. Before we end the episode, I want to share a bit about my journey as a podcaster. I started podcasting in 2020, and in the last two years, I've had the opportunity to interview more than 250 founders who are shaping India's future across sectors. If you also want to speak to the best minds in your field and build an enviable network, then you must consider becoming a podcaster. And the first step to becoming a podcaster starts with Zencaster, which takes care of all the nuts and bolts of podcasting, from remote recording to editing to distribution and finally monetization. If you are planning to check out the platform, then please show your support for the Founder Thesis podcast by using this link, zen.ai slash founder thesis. That's zen.ai slash founder thesis.